Hi, I'm Carrie Roberts. I work for the Kelsey Museum of Archaeology at the University of Michigan. I am a conservator, and today I'm going to be talking about green pigments from late period through Roman period Egypt. So I'll be sharing with you some findings from my study of green pigments from these periods. And um, this research took place over the course of two years while I worked as a conservation fellow at the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, it was an inciting investigation as the materials and techniques used during these later periods in Egypt's early history uh, are relatively understudied in the conservation world. So during this presentation, I'll share some information about how this project began. I'll discuss the methodology I used to conduct the survey, examination, and analysis portions of my study. And I'll highlight one of the tools I used to investigate ancient paint surfaces, multispectral imaging. I'll share three case studies to illustrate some of the results I drew from this research. And finally, my conclusions, or rather observations, as this research, I hope, will continue. My interest in the Egyptian color palette was sparked when I encountered a surprising green pigment on a stela. This stela was excavated by the University of Michigan at the Romano-Egyptian ne necropolis of Terenuthis in the mid-1930s. And like the other 400 or so reliefs found there, the stela had occupied a niche in one of the built tombs at the site. This stela was unusual in that it was painted, its background was painted with a blue-green pigment. X-ray fluorescent spectroscopy showed none of the signatures expected in a copper pigment, however, which is what we were expecting. And further analysis with X-ray diffraction revealed the pigment to be selatinite an iron-based clay mineral referred to in the conservation literature as green earth. So why is this interesting? Well, you just don't often see green earth on Egyptian artifacts, or so I thought. Green as a color is highly significant in Egyptian funerary arts, as it's used as a sig signifier of the rebirth of Osiris. Um, if you look at this slide, you'll see that Osiris and the deities surrounding him in the stela and Osiris on the relief painting are green. And if you look at the figure on the upper left, um, this is the priest Jehudimos, or the coffin of the priest Jehudimos, um, whose coffin resides at the Kelsey Museum. His, screen, his skin is also green. So my initial research following finding green earth on this particular stela at the Kelsey indicated changes in the green color palette starting in the Ptolemaic and Roman periods in Egypt. The pigment most often cited in the technical literature is Egyptian green, or green frit, whose colorant is a copper mineral. So an example of green frit can be seen on the same slide um, on this New Kingdom paint palette on the bottom right. Um, and this is a good example of the type of pigment referenced in core publications uh, such as Lucas, Nicholson, and, Sh and Shaw, etc. Um, these publications focus on pharaonic material culture, uh, rather than materials from later periods, though. However, more recent technical studies at the British Museum, the Courtauld, and the Art Institute of Chicago revealed the use of other types of green, including green earth, on Egyptian artifacts. So I was curious to see if a discernible change could be uh, revealed if I were to compare the results of these later technical studies um, as well as cr contribute to this bank of knowledge myself through further study. I started my research in full with a survey of previously analyzed artifacts while gathering new data by conducting technical studies of artifacts in museums with major Egyptian collections. The overarching goal of this research has really been to build a knowledge base about these materials and from this, observe trends in pigment use in Egypt under Greek and Roman rule. I carried out the survey portion of my research largely at the J. Paul Getty Museum, where I began compiling a list of artifacts from relevant periods that had been subject to pigment analysis. From the notes and data I've compiled thus far, I could count 25 examples of late to Roman period artifacts whose green pigments had been fully characterized. And if you look at the figure on the right, this is an example uh, of a Roman Egyptian sculpture. It's a ceramic Horus sculpture. Um, that's kept at the British Museum. And it, you can't really tell looking at it now, but it was once fully painted. In fact, its skirt was painted with green earth pigment. 
So in order to really observe trends, I knew that I'd need to look at more artifacts. 25 is not enough to be statistically viable, right? Okay. So I had the chance to do this in depth, the J. Paul Getty Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At both institutions, I was fortunate not only to work with curators and conservators specializing in the study of Egyptian artifacts, but also conservation scientists whose expertise lay in the characterization of ancient materials, including paint. With the help of scientists, I was able to, able to gather elemental and compositional information on pigments, both non-invasively and through sampling of paint surfaces using the te instrumental techniques listed here. In addition to instrumental analysis, I used imaging techniques to examine ancient paint surfaces and gather useful preliminary information on the possible composition of paints as they were being analyzed. At the Metropolitan Museum, I was fortunate to meet conservation scientist Joanne Dyer, who is among many things a photochemist and a co-author of a fantastic online manual for multispectral imaging that I should note is available for free download on the British Museum website. Joanne was a tremendous help to me in my research at the Met, and she also helped implement an updated system of multispectral image capture, processing, and calibration in the Objects Conservation Laboratory at the Met. And she's also my, one of my co-authors. <laughs> so what exactly is multispectral imaging? Some of you are more familiar, maybe more familiar with this form of imaging than others, but for those who are less familiar, very simply put, MSI involves the capturing of images both inside and outside the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light is only one part of a broader electromagnetic spectrum that includes ultraviolet light, so radiation below 400 nanometers, and infrared light, radiation above 700 nanometers, to the left and the right of the visible range that you see on the screen. Multispectral imaging takes advantage of the distinct responses different materials have when illuminated with different light wavelengths along the spectrum. With reflected images, the light source and captured response fall within the gen generally the same spectral range. With luminescence images, the light source is at a lower wavelength generally than the captured response. For example, with visible induced infrared luminescence, one technique, the object's surface is illuminated with visible light. And in response, Egyptian blue luminesces at a specific wavelength in the infrared range of the spectrum. With a modified, excuse me, with a modified camera and the proper filters, this response can be captured in an image. And here's an example of a visible induced infrared image of a third intermediate period coffin showing Egyptian blue luminescence. The great thing about multispectral imaging is that it's relatively easy to set up and portable. For example, in addition to using it in the labs at the Getty and the Met, I've been able to bring equipment with me on research visits to the Field Museum, the Oriental Institute, and other museums, as well, up set up, as, well as set up an MSI photo booth at the excavations at Salonente, Sicily, um, run by the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. MSI is a useful investigation tool. Visual identification of green can be challenging. For example, on this same third intermediate period coffin, blue areas appear green alongside actual green areas of paint because of a yellowed coating on the surface. VIL imaging allows us to visually differentiate between green and blue since only Egyptian blue luminesces at that particular wavelength in the infrared, while Egyptian green does not. Although not fully diagnostic, MSI can also provide evidence of what a pigment's chemical makeup could be. Egyptian blue is not the only ancient pigment to display unique properties when exposed to different wavelengths of light. My colleague at the Met, conservator Anna Serrata, who is also a co-author on this paper, shares an enthusiasm for imaging and came up with the great idea of putting together a reference paint panel set made of Egyptian pigments in a combination of binding media. We expose these panels to different light wavelengths and use the images we gathered as references as we conducted MSI on actual artifacts. Which brings me to my first case study. This cartonnage fragment is preserved at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and shows a scene of deities, including Isis, Nephthys, Horus, Anubis, and Toth, 
and two priests facing a seated Osiris. To the left of the figures are hieroglyphs and determinatives in the form of seated figures, and above is a row of stars beneath a, a line of hieroglyphs. The fragment is thought to be Ptolemaic or Roman, and it's also thought to be from the Daklo Oasis. While examining and documenting this artifact, we carried out a full suite of multispectral imaging using ultraviolet, visible, and infrared light sources. Visible-induced infrared luminescence proved useful in differentiating between blue and green paint areas. On this object, the blue and green were close in color due to the darkening or chemical alteration of the Egyptian blue paint areas. So if you look at the figure of Anubis, his shoulder and, and upper torso um, are kind of dark blue and dark green in color, and it's hard to tell visually which is which. But if you look at the Ville image, you can clearly differentiate between the Egyptian blue on his arms and neck and the not Egyptian blue on the rest of his torso. But even more interesting to me, at least, was the response that areas of green showed to ultraviolet light. They appeared almost black under long wave UV light. Further analysis, including XRF spectroscopy and FTIR spectroscopy, revealed the green to be a combination of two types of pigments. Conservation scientist Adriana Rizzo identified both copper, fatty acid, and selatinite. The fatty acid might once have been a green frit or Egyptian green, or possibly a copper mineral such as malachite. But the pigment has likely altered through chemical interaction with the wax binder used to mix the paint. The selatinite, if you may recall, is a green earth mineral, making this a mixture of copper and iron green pigments. The characteristic of appearing very dark, almost black, under UV is something that seems to occur with copper green paints that are mixed in animal glue and plant gum, two of the most common paint binders in Egyptian art. Other artifacts painted with copper-based green pigments at the Met also demonstrated this characteristic absorption under UV light. My next case study is of this painted wooden coffin fragment with a mummy form figure on a cushion, also at the Met, and also thought to be Ptolemaic or Roman Egyptian. XRF and FTIR analysis, again performed by Dr. Rizzo, indicate that the green of the cushion is likely composed of selatinite or green earth pigment. Green earth by itself was generally not as UV absorbent as copper containing green pigments. However, the green earth samples on our paint reference panels show that the degree of absorbance can depend a great deal on the source of the pigment. So if you look at the upper white, white square, um, the paint out on top is actually Verona green earth and the paint out Below it is cypress green earth, and the cypress green earth is not as absorbent as the Verona green earth. So source of the green earth pigment can be a factor, but so can the binder that the pigment is mixed into. However, we can see from these two examples that some greens are more UV absorbent than others. Which brings me to my final case study. Um, this is a painted mummy shroud fragment, also dated to the Ptolemaic or Roman periods, and also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You can make out the shoulder and elbow of a mummy form figure and a wadjet eye amulet over an elaborately painted checkered background. During imaging, we noticed that green paint areas appeared red in the infrared false color images we took. False color images like this combine the infrared reflected images, image with elements of the visible light image that are produced. Um, to produce specific colors that can help characterize specific pigments. We noticed that in false color images of our paint panels, certain pigments also appeared red, including indigo. And as you can see in the black squares, this is occurring across different binding media. And indeed, instrumental analysis carried out by conservation scientist Julie Arslanelou revealed that indigo is present in the green areas sampled. XRF also picked up the element arsenic. Arsenic is a component of the yellow pigment orpiment, which is often found on later period Egyptian paint surfaces and which appears to have been used in other areas of this shroud. Indigo and orpiment are the two components of the pig pigment mixture Virgo. 
Although best known for its use in medieval manuscripts, Virgo has also been found on Roman Egyptian artifacts, such as the Red Shroud Mummy of Heraclides at the Jake Paul Getty Museum. It's possible that Virgo is the green, green colorant on the mummy shroud shown here as well. So, three artifacts, three very different sources of green color. This is representative of, of what appears to be appears to be an expansion in the types of green pigments and pigment combinations being used during the Greco-Roman period in Egypt. In spite of, if you see this graph, <laughs> the very clear bias toward Greco-Roman materials, and I'll just make a note here, more third intermediate period and late period artifacts need to be examined for this to, <laughs> for this to be considered conclusive, as do the total number of samples for it to be considered statistically viable. However, from what we have, you can see a significant increase in the use of green earth pigment, as well as mixtures starting in the Ptolemaic period. Could this be attributed to the introduction of new painting techniques as a result of foreign rule or the and the eventual annexation of Egypt into the Roman Empire? Why the sudden plethora of greens when the technology to create Egyptian blue and Egyptian green continued into the Ptolemaic and Roman periods? Many questions remain. And one that I've continued to really ponder is, where did artists source their green earth? Did they get it from known sources in Italy or Cyprus, or from deposits in Egypt's western desert? There's still much to explore. Even with these lingering questions, this project has provided some useful takeaways. And one is that visually differentiating between um, altered blue or a yellow coating covered blue and actual green pigment can be aided by multispectral imaging. Multispectral imaging can also help differentiate preliminarily between copper-based greens and iron-based greens. And MSI can be very useful in discerning green paint mixtures. Multispectral imaging coupled with analysis can allow us to compare the reflectance and luminescence properties of analyzed and unanalyzed surfaces this is an important tool, considering that sampling and the removal of samples for analysis is not always possible. And I reference here Egyptian antiquities laws that make it difficult to remove samples from the country. It is a useful preliminary investigative tool, MSI, one that can be used to make an initial case for further analysis. I'd like to thank the institutions and individuals listed here for their guidance and support over the past two years, especially my co-authors, Anna Serrata and Joanne Dyer. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>